This is the beginning of part two of our module on measuring and managing counterparty credit risk, which examines in detail counterparty credit risk under OTC derivatives and shows you how to model this exposure for standard derivative contracts, in addition to reviewing common techniques for the mitigation of this risk. We remind you that this part two contains a single chapter, chapter two, which reviews and compares the common techniques for mitigating counterparty credit risk, including netting, collateral and margining mechanisms, and a number of contractual devices, such as recouponing and early termination clauses. In general, if counterparty risk is not mitigated in any manner and there is more than one trade outstanding when a counterparty defaults, the maximum loss for the bank would equal the sum of the credit exposures under each contract. Therefore, the total PFE to the counterparty at time t would be set as the sum of the PFEs under each contract as shown in this equation where V lower i t is the value of contract i at time t. This exposure is reduced if legally enforceable netting agreements are signed by the two parties. A netting agreement is a contractual clause which provides that in the event of default by either counterparty, negative closeout values may be offset against positive closeout values leading to a single net positive value in favor of one party or the other. For example, if counterparty A enters two transactions with the bank, an IRS and an FX forward, and if upon counterparty A's default these have market values of $10 million in favor of the bank and $5 million in favor of the client, respectively, then the bank's exposure will be limited to 5 million, i.e. 10 minus 5, if legally enforceable netting is in place, versus 10 million if it is not. More generally, the aggregate credit exposure arising under all transactions within the same governing law jurisdiction of the netting agreement, often called the netting set, shrinks to the larger of zero and the net portfolio value as shown in this equation. There can be several netting agreements in place with a single counterparty. For example, it may be that contracts booked in a particular country or belonging to a particular product family may be netted against each other but not against contracts booked in another country or belonging to a different product family. In addition, some transactions may not be covered by any netting agreement. The enforceability of netting agreement in any jurisdiction needs confirmation with strong legal opinions to this day, a number of important jurisdictions do not recognize fully the enforceability of netting. Counterparty credit exposures may be further mitigated through the use of collateral. If collateral with value CT is posted by the counterparty, against a netting set P, the 
counterparty exposure becomes this expression here. If netting is not enforceable and collateral amounts of CIT are placed against each position, the exposure to each position becomes this expression here. The PFE profile for the total portfolio is reached via the preceding equation. More generally, a portfolio might have a combination of various netting nodes in which netting is allowed within but not across the different nodes and a series of positions where netting is not permitted at all. The total PFE for such a portfolio would now be calculated via a combination of the equations above. For example, the PFE for a portfolio consisting of two netting nodes, P1 and P2, and a third sub-portfolio P3 of positions for which netting is not permitted would be the following equation here. where I belonging to PJ means contract I belonging to the portfolio PJ. The third widely used credit mitigation technique involves the use of margin agreements. A margin agreement is a contractual arrangement under which the counterparty posts collateral when its exposure exceeds pre-established thresholds. Bilateral agreements define thresholds for each of the two counterparties, requiring either one to post collateral depending on the direction of the transaction's fair value. Usually the threshold schedule is a function of each counterparty's credit rating with poorly rated counterparties posting collateral if a relatively low threshold is reached and higher rated counterparties posting collateral if some higher threshold is reached. A margining agreement has several important features. The unsecured or alternatively called margin threshold is the maximum amount an exposure can reach before the affected party can demand collateral. The margin call frequency defines how often collateral calls may be made daily, weekly, etc. A cure period is a time period that often follows a default by one of the parties postponing enforcement of the other party's rights until the end of this cure period during which the defaulting party has the opportunity to cure or remedy the default. Cure periods may be stipulated in the margining agreement as a contractual matter or sometimes are imposed by statute. The implication of any cure period is that the exposure of the non-defaulting party lengthens for the duration of the cure period. In effect, this exposes this non-defaulting party to a reduction in the value of the collateral from the most recent exchange until the date on which the default has occurred and been declared, the existing positions have been closed out, collateral has been seized and liquidated, and any required rehedging of market risk has been completed. Modeling the risk of margining agreements must therefore reflect this additional risk 
in such instance, instances. Collateral agreements cannot eliminate counterparty risk entirely. Exposures may exist below the minimum thresholds. Market movements may increase the exposure between margin call dates and between the time of the most recent collateral exchange and the time of default and trade closeout. In addition, the available collateral may depreciate during the closeout period, especially if it is in the form of securities rather than cash. We will simulate later in this module the impact of potential market movements between margin call dates. But for our first simulation, we assume that the exposure of a collateralized portfolio cannot exceed the margin threshold amount for the defaulting counterparty, denoted by MTC. In such a case, for a one-sided collateral agreement with fully enforceable netting, PFE becomes this expression here, where CT is this expression here. This is equivalent to these two expressions here. With bilateral collateral agreements, the exposure calculation becomes more complicated due to what is known as over-collateralization risk. Consider an agreement between Bank B and the counterparty C, where the margin threshold is MTC for the counterparty and MTB for the bank. Assume the por portfolio value is negative from B's perspective. So B delivers collateral to C. Assume further that at some point thereafter the position turns around and now becomes positive from B's perspective so that B seeks a recall of his collateral but that C defaults at this very moment. In this situation, B may find himself unable to recover the amount of over-collateralization. For example, if C has repledged the collateral to other counterparties. Thus, B's PFE towards C in this situation becomes this expression here where CT is given by this expression here. Additional features of some margining agreements include independent amount representing a fixed collateral amount delivered on a trade-by-trade -trade basis and retained by the recipient until the maturity of the specified trade, and minimum transfer amount, MTA, which represents a minimum threshold amount below which no collateral is required. MTAs reduce the administration costs of collateral arrangements. A fourth credit mitigation technique is known as recouponing or reset. Here the counterparties settle the fair value of a particular trade and in some cases of a portfolio of trades at specific time intervals. For example, a yearly recouponing requires payment by one counterparty to the other on each anniversary of the transaction of the fair value of the transaction, pulling PFE down to zero at the beginning of each year. The terms of the transaction are also reset at that time 
to reflect current market conditions and to bring fair value down to zero, hence the name recouponing. The final type of credit mitigation technique uses early termination provisions, such as liquidity puts, credit triggers, and other similar clauses to reduce credit exposures by shortening the effective maturity of the transaction. Liquidity puts give either party, or sometimes one party only, the right to settle and terminate a transaction on pre-specified dates, usually by paying or receiving the fair value of the transaction on that date. Credit triggers specify that trades must be settled if one party's credit rating falls below a pre-specified level. We now illustrate the impact of these different credit mitigation techniques on a portfolio's PFE. We assume that a bank's portfolio of derivatives with a counterparty includes the following three transactions. The five-year $200 million IRS examined previously, under which the customer pays six-month LIBOR and receives 5% the FX forward examined previously, in which the customer is buying 50 million euros against dollars for settlement in three years, and a second FX forward under which the customer is selling 20 million euros against dollars for settlement in one year. Again, we apply the Monte Carlo simulation process to calculate the various exposure measures, this time reflecting each of the different credit mitigation techniques. The first five steps are similar to what we illustrated in the previous examples, so we do not repeat them here. Market factors are once again Euro-Dollar spot and the dollar and Euro interest rates. And again, we assume that both yield curves are flat and move only in parallel shifts up or down. The calculations appear in this worksheet simulation of Excel file simulation, with the details for each transaction summarized in these three boxes here. We use the same initial inputs in these cells here and stochastic processes as we did from the original FX forward example. The discrete set of simulation times span monthly intervals from 1 all the way to 60 and random values from a standardized normal distribution appear in these three sets of rows. Z1 over here, then Z2, and finally Z3. Then future levels for each of the three market factors are generated for the next 60 months in these rows here for dollar interest rates, euro interest rates, and finally euro dollar spot, all while respecting the stipulated 
Correlation estimates for percentage changes in market factors. Finally, we revalue each contract using these simulated market factors. First, the IRS in these rows here, then the one year forward in these rows here, and finally the three year forward in these rows here. To keep the Excel file to a manageable size, we have copied these values into Excel file portfolio .xls, worksheet, netting and collateral, and specifically into the three tables appearing now and starting on row 24. The portfolio PFE for each scenario J and at each future date TK is calculated first down here under the assumption that no netting agreement is in place. For example, cell D1528 aggregates the individual PFEs, as explained earlier, through the equation appearing both here and reproduced on the right for your convenience. Where the superscript PF refers to the portfolio, the superscript SW to the swap, and F1 and F3 to the one year and three year FX forwards. The PFE assuming enforceable netting is calculated in cells C2029 all the way to BK2528. Via this equation here and again reproduced over on the right. Assuming netting is not enforceable, but individual collateral amounts of $3 million are available for each transaction, as indicated in the title here. We calculate the resulting PFE for the portfolio in these cells here. For example, as explained earlier, here is the calculation for entry in cell D2530 based on the equation appearing over on the right. Assuming netting is enforceable and collateral of $9 million is available for the entire portfolio, as indicated in the title here, we calculate the resulting PFE for the portfolio in these rows here via this equation reproduced again over on the right.
the impact of the margining agreement on the portfolio and on its PFE is calculated in these cells here under the assumptions that netting is enforceable margin call frequency is monthly and that the margining threshold is nine million dollars all of which you can see in the title for example cell D3532 this cell here is calculated via this equation here as always reproduced over on the right in its algebraic form here finally we simulate the impact of recouponing on the portfolio PFE assuming netting and a recouponing frequency of one year i.e. that the portfolio fair value is reset to zero every year taking into consideration also maturing contracts and the results for this appear in these rows here the exposure measures are calculated for each case at the bottom with peak PFE reported in this table that has just appeared and a little further down expected exposure for each of the different scenarios we are contemplating in this final table here these results are all plotted in a number of graphs appearing on the right which we turn to next there are four of these graphs the top two graphs represent the evolution of peak PFE with the maximum peak PFE also indicated the two graphs at the bottom down here relate to the expected exposure the two graphs on the left assume that netting is not enforceable while the two graphs on the right assume that it is enforceable as you can see from the labels finally on each graph we superimpose in brown our base case scenario for the sake of comparison and we remind you that in this scenario we assume that netting is enforceable but that there are no other credit mitigants you can see from this top left graph that the exposure increases steadily until month 36 then drops significantly this drop of course results from the settlement of the three-year FX forward on that date which therefore exits the portfolio and thereafter the exposure is identical to what we had in chapter one 
since only the interest rate swap survives. Netting visibly reduces credit exposure as seen from the lower level of the brown line reflecting enforceable netting versus this gray one where netting is unenforceable. Then starting in month 36, netting has no further impact and the brown and gray become one since the portfolio includes just one remaining contract. Individual collateral also reduces credit exposure in the absence of enforceable netting as evidenced on this bottom left graph for expected exposure but its impact on peak PFE is more limited where netting without collateral the brown produces virtually the same benefits up to month 16 for peak PFE as the collateralized scenario without netting. You will understand better the reasons for this pattern when we analyze the incremental impact of individual transactions on portfolio PFE in Chapter 3. Credit mitigation strategies offer superior protection in the presence of enforceable netting as evidenced by the graphs on the right both for peak PFE and for expected exposure. The strategy with collateral fixed at 9 million in the dark blue reduces expected exposure significantly as you can see in this graph here at the bottom right but its capacity to cap exposure is limited however particularly particularly when the transactions in the portfolio have long maturities and their cash flows do not amortize recouponing agreements in turquoise also play a significant role in exposure reduction in both graphs on the right but their benefits evidence significant volatility between recouponing dates exactly as you would expect Margining agreements in the olive color are the most effective at capping credit exposure. Fixing the margin threshold caps credit exposure and hence the maximum loss the bank could incur following a counterparty default. This is reflected in this olive colored straight line in the graph for peak PFE this one here this maximum loss of 9 million is equal quite simply to the margin threshold which the bank presumably would increase or decrease 
depending on its comfort level with the counterparty's credit. End users are often more amenable to margining agreements than to fixed collateral agreements demanding collateral upfront, since margining in the first case is dependent on the value of the transaction and moves up and down depending on the movements in risk factors. Many end users find this fairer than an upfront collateral requirement that is independent of the transaction's value. We conclude this chapter by emphasizing a point we raised a minute ago. Margin agreements leave the parties vulnerable to potential increases in exposure resulting from market movements between margin call dates. In Excel file portfolio.xls worksheet margin frequency appearing now. We use the same inputs and methodology as previously and compare for a specific market scenario the evolution of the portfolio PFE over 60 days specified in the future. Assuming alternatively daily and then weekly margin calls. As you can see from these two labels here, the first one for case one indicating instantaneous collateralization and the second case two weekly posting of collateral. And in both cases, we assume, as you can see, a margin threshold of $8 million. Daily time intervals appear in row 26, specifically cell C26, all the way to BK. 26 over here. Then rows 27 to 39 are very similar to what we saw before. The only difference being the time intervals and the contract maturities, which in the present instance are the remaining maturities. Current portfolio exposure is calculated in cell C41 right here and PFE in the cells to its right. All the way to BK41 as before. In the first scenario with daily margining, starting on row 43, to row 45, the collateral balance that equals the excess of PFE over the $8 million margin threshold is posted on each day that the threshold is breached. In this example, credit exposure on row 44 equals the $8 million margin threshold since the portfolio value appearing on row 41 is always greater than 
this margin threshold. The margin calls appearing on row 45 are the daily changes, as you can see from their formula, positive or negative in the collateral balance from row 43. The first of our two graphs that you're about to see This one here shows the evolution over the 60 days of the por portfolio value in turquoise, of the collateral balance in blue, of the credit exposure in brown and of the margin calls in gray. Now we turn to the weekly alternative which appears starting down here on row 46, 47 to 49. And we calculate the same items but assuming weekly margining calls instead. The second of our graphs, the one further on the right appearing now, shows the credit exposure for both daily and weekly collateral posting scenarios. This graph confirms that in this scenario credit exposure changes significantly between margin call dates by more than 25 percent for example on day 19. Banks usually reflect this risk in their analysis by means of quantitative interpolation techniques between margin call dates. This completes this chapter 2 and part 2 of this module.